Assalamu alaikum everyone, I hope you're doing well. The context of this video is the recent debate um, between Inspiring Philosophy and Daniel Haqiqajo, uh, which is on the topic of the marriage of, uh, well, indirectly at least, it's related to the marriage of Aisha to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and particularly the position that Haqiqajo was defending was the one whereby Aisha um, is said to be nine years old which is actually the strongest position compared to those who say that she was older because we find it in strongly Sahih Hadith like, um, you know, the Sahihain, the Sahih Bukhari and so on. And in particular though, I did not want to tackle that debate directly because it would take more time. Um, but I wanted to tackle one of the other videos with I, which Inspiring Philosophy did, which is titled, Did Muhammad Marry a Child? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when looking at the video, I was curious to see, you know, I know that Christians make this argument, which is actually a liberal, secular argument. It's not even a religious one. Um, and I wanted to see what was the argument, you know. And when I went through that video, and it was actually a response of IP to somebody who maybe did a video addressed to him on TikTok or whatever, trying to explain how that's, you know, contradictory and how the age was normal for 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 that, that age marrying at that age was normal in the past and so on and so forth and then there were certain um, critiques that ip brought about which i mean he is not stupid you know he studied but the critiques were really low level which either leads you to think that he's actually stupid that ip is stupid which is not or that he's dishonest so let's go through this take our time and try to understand to unpack this and yeah, this is maybe going to take a bit more than the usual short one minute video that, for example, IP is doing recently. But that's useful because in order to understand important topics, you need to unpack them. You need to take the time and the patience to actually understand what's going on. And at the end of the day, the argument is going to be easy, but let's be detailed so that we can really unpack what it says. So I'm not an expert in editing videos. You're not going to see him talking and me responding, but I'm going to refer to things that he says throughout this video in this sort of video essay that I'm doing. So the first thing is that IP argues that, and listen very carefully, only those in the time and region of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam did not criticize the Prophet's marriage to Aisha after she reached puberty. This is one of the points raised by the person in the video that IP was responding to. And he says, yes, of course, because, you know, that's the corrupted culture of the Prophet of, of Muhammad Wasallam, and it's normal that he, that nobody criticizes it. But that's actually false, like completely false, because the lack of critique concerning this did not only not come from his local region and culture and time, but also beyond that. Uh, we're talking about centuries after that of critiques, even coming from Christianity, that looked at that and did not budge an eye and actually defended the marriage of the Prophet to Aisha, even though they wrote things that were there to criticize and discredit the Prophet. Let's see an example. An interesting text that we can mention is that of the English theologian Prido Humphrey, which is called, the, text of, the name of the text is The True Nature of Imposture, Fully Shown in the Life of Mahomet, or Muhammad, you know? And it's a, it's a text of 1697, and the text analyzes the life of Prophet Muhammad in an apologetic and anti-Islam key, using Islamic sources or attempting to use Islamic sources with the aim to prove precisely the alleged imposture of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. On page 50 or 52 of the text, Prido speaks of Aisha's marriage to the Prophet. Oh, let's get ready. Now, you know, this is a theologian. It's, it's, even like um, 1697, it's not even that, that, that classic, you know, uh, like it's not even that, that recent. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still uh, something interesting to see. And Prido is quite known in, in, the, in the environment, you know, Prido speaks of Aisha's marriage to the prophet in, and, and in what of, in, in what for Prido should have been a perfect occasion to morally, to morally attack the prophet than the obvious occurs. There is no attack. Prido does not attack the prophet when it comes to the marriage of Aisha. And he is very much aware of the age gap. And he says that, you know, he takes actually care to explain carefully why Aisha was married to the Prophet when she was very young. Even anticipating the age. He actually, in his text, he, said, he anticipates the age of marriage by one year. He says that they were married, uh, that they were consummated married at eight. And equating it with the norm of the time. Prilo says that's the norm of the time and place. And he also refers to how this was a normal practice in a large area of the then known world. This is Prido, 1697, page 52. 
And uh, I'm going to read now the, the, the extract from the text, which is the following. After the death of his first wife, of, of the first wife Khadija, first wife of the Prophet Khadija, Muhammad the Prophet took his place with two other wives, Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, and Sauda, the daughter of Zama. And shortly afterwards, he added to them Hafsa, the daughter of Omar, thus by becoming son-in-law to three of the leading men of his party. And this point of connecting to men of his party is very important. IP misses that. It's going to be important later on. But let's go step by step. He made them, by that alliance, still more firmly bound to his interest than he. You know, this is an important point. Again, we're going to talk about it later. But the, he, the Prophet is also creating stronger connection to his friends and allies, okay? We, via these marriages. And this was normal at the time. Aisha was then only six, and so she did not consume until two years later. Actually, it was three years later, according to Muslim sources, because it is normal. This is Prido, it's not me. Because it is normal in those hot countries, as in all of India, which is the same climatic zone as Arabia, for women to be ripe for marriage at that age and also to have children the following year. Prido. IP, let's continue. Then, uh, and we will get to more quotes later on, but let's see. IP claims that a popular that uh, ah, yeah, yeah ip then says look you know popularity of a, of a belief does not mean that it's objectively right or wrong because he's saying look nobody criticizes it and he's right in that but he's wrong in another thing that when you talk about the morality of marrying at a certain age you have to take into account the historical approach this is key so if for centuries no culture whatsoever that ever engaged with the topic of the prophet's marriage ever criticized him even when the culture is yours ip christianity itself as we've seen with prado and others actually you have to either concede that you're wrong and using another moral standard so you have to admit that you're using another moral standard which is the secular liberal pseudo morality that you're actually peddling or all of those christians were wrong so find me find us a classical non-liberal set a classical non-liberal and non-secular source where the marriage of the prophet to Aisha was actually criticized. And you can't. And if you can, I'm very curious to see. Maybe I don't know. So this is a challenge. Bring that source if you can. Then he claims that a morally perfect being's ordinances and orders and commandments cannot foresee cultural shifts. He says it indirectly. He says, look, if this is an example of the prophet Muhammad and this is supposed to be the eternal guidance for all time, this is not moral. How can God order this, you know? But the thing is, and because now we consider that to be wrong, you know, and that's fine even for Islam, but let's see how. The problem is that uh, um, Islam cannot only prove its truthfulness theologically with arguments, with the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad and, 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 and other things, you know, like prophecies and miracles the Prophet did. But um, the divine laws in Islam foresee an element of historical adaptability. And this is known, like it's not something new in, 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 in jurisprudence. Um, and that's normal because for the final revelation, this sort of elasticity should be allowed. It makes sense. So let's take the example of marriage. There are various principles that come into play when it comes to marriage. And this is something that Daniel Hakikaju in their debate missed. I think, you know, Daniel Hakikaju has his own approach. He said it multiple times. He goes for the hardest, most hardcore position, the strictest of the strictest. Sometimes I believe in going beyond what actually the text allows. You know, he just goes for the craziest position because he says he wants to create the space for the more normal positions to be there. You know, he, if he can defend the craziest position, which he did actually in the debate, I, I, it's just wrong. You know, he, depend, he, 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 he seemed like he was defending the fact that he could marry at two, three-year-old, like, consummate the marriage there if the body is ready. That's just stupidity, stupidity, because uh, there are Islamic principles that come into play that would never prevent it. You're not going to have, for example, the rushed, I will see, at two or three years old. You're not going to respect the principle of the dalar wa the, no, the Islamic no-harm principle at that age, you know? So he just went for the craziest position because he wants to show, look, I can defend this, so you can defend a, 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 a normal position, a more... I don't want to say moderate because we don't care about moderation uh, according to liberal standards, but moderate and common according to Islamic principles. So I think there it was a mistake. He could have easily destroyed IP if he just went for the normal Islamic position, which is what? Well, which is the following. Um, where were we? Yes, so there are principles that come into place when you have to, for example, marry. 
and these are um, the principle of balagh. We also find it in the Quran. The balagh is basically puberty, you know, physical maturity, puberty, which for women would be the period. Uh, and then you have rushd, you know, if the person has, for example, mental health issues, cannot the person cannot intend, then the marriage and its consummation be invalid. Then you have urf, cultural norm as well come into play in custom. Uh, and this is also mentioned in the Quran multiple times and scholars as well. They come to the top bil ma'roof, which is according also to what is customary within the limits of God. So there is that. La darar wa la dirar. The principle, the no harm principle, the Islamic no harm principle. So any sort of engagement in this case. So it can't, the marriage contract is seen really as a contractual transactions as well. Transaction as well. That transaction cannot bring about harm. Direct harm, nor nor reciproca reciprocation of harm. So you know, if you put that into 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 account, you will see how it was normal in the past. But today, today we say no. For example, because the the, the principle of rush is not expected, the principle of urf is not respected, the principle of ledara is not respected. But that also depends on the country. This protects us from having sort of a colonialist uh, approach, which IP has. We don't go to other cultures saying you're a barbaric because you're doing that. We have principles Islam gives us. We see if the person has reached Balagh, Rushd, Urf, the Ladarar principle is respected. And then we can say, okay, maybe we, we dislike something that is happening in certain cultures, but we um, it, it's something that is allowed in the spectrum of morality of human beings. You know, it, it is a spectrum within Hudud, within limits that Allah then uh, puts forward to protect what is objectively right and objectively and, and prevent us from what is objectively wrong. So it's actually interesting OIP, that you would defend a specific age which magically fits secular and liberal 21st century standards with intellectual acrobatics, like also you did with Haikita Jews debate, which actually contradict the historical reality. Females were married at puberty for millennia, before the coming of the Prophet and after. Period. That's that's it. There's no other sort of argument you can make. You can make shenanigans, you can make acrobatics, but that's the fact. Now, IP also claims that the Prophet's morality was the product of the corrupt morality of his time. But truly, that was the morality for millennia before and after when it comes to marrying at puberty. Rashi, who was a very known Jewish commentator, even claims that you can marry children at three by connecting to a calculation of the age of Rebecca. Now, we don't really know if Rebecca has that age because it doesn't specify uh, when the events in Mount Moira happen, like... When Rebecca was born, it doesn't specify how much time was passed be between that. People make calculation and say she was three. But Jewish commentators and Rashi and others actually don't see any issue by saying that you can marry children at three. You know? So you have that in texts. You can say that they were wrong, but they were accepted normally as the common position. You know? So there is that. And of course, Islam does not support this because we have Islamic principles that are more accurate. Now, he claims also that... Um, nine-year-old people cannot comprehend but that's true that, like, like, that's false he's actually superimposing today's mental maturity standards to that of the past where for example mortality rates which much 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 were much higher the life expectancy was much was much lower and the mental maturity and expectation were also quite different people matured much earlier marrying too young today can be considered wrong in some areas of the world like for example in, in, in the West or many developing countries because of Islam's principles, the ones that we mentioned. And there are contexts where that is not objectively wrong based on necessity and context. Now, this is not even just true today. Let's take a biblical example. This is why, for example, Adam and Eve's children did, did incest, according to the Bible and also according to Islamic uh, principle, because it was a specific exceptional occasion. Their children were allowed that because of the context and necessity, because they had to continue the species. But then it was prohibited. So what happened? Are you saying that God changed his mind or oh, inspiring philosophy? Ordering a necessary perversion first and then changing his mind? That's not, just not true. You know, you have elasticity in the laws, which is normal. IP then claims that anachronistic fallacy does not work. He, he knows that that's coming. You know, in the video he knows. He said, oh, you cannot say that I'm doing an anachronistic fallacy because the guy in the video that he is criticizing Muslim in the video he's criticizing said you're doing an anachronistic fallacy and he says no you cannot do that IP says because the prophet's example is supposed to be timeless but we already responded to that fool 
That's a straw man because you think that this means the context-based rules and adaptation rules cannot happen um, as a divine dispensation, but that's totally false. He thinks that the prophet should have done what? Come with an age, the magical 18 years old or 21 or 16? Or he should have come with a specific age? That's nonsense. If anything, the principle, the Islamic principles of Balag, physical maturity, rushed, mental aspect, ledarar, or ledirar, the no harm and no reciprocating harm principle, and orf, what is customary, prove that the Prophet's morality is timeless and the best for all times and places rather than the secular, liberal, neo-colonialist approach of IP, which he masquerades as Christianity while not having anything Abrahamic about it, to be honest. This is why he's like, he's against polygamy, he's against, you know, this sort of principle that we're discussing because he's just submitted to the secular liberal thing. He's not really submitting to the law of God, you know. IP even attempts to quote Fath al-Bari. That was the funniest part, guys. He attempts to quote Fath al-Bari in his video, where allegedly it claims that Aisha did not reach puberty. He says, oh, look, Fath al-Bari says that you should not reach puberty when the Prophet consummated marriage with her. But guess what? It's the usual humiliation that befalls some um, uh, Islamophobes. Uh, which happens to be Christian most of the time, but not all of them, to be honest. IP, in fact, reads a translation. Literally, you see that the screen is split in two in the video. It's going to be linked, by the way, in the comments, so you can also go there. You have the screen split in two in the video. On the right side, you have Arabic. I can read that. On the left side, you have English. And in the English, you have a part in brackets which says that the marriage was consummated um, before puberty, before this, the period of Aisha, but that's actually not present in the Arabic text. You know, um, that's actually something that the translator added because maybe he was pushing his own position. But anyway, you know, um, Fath al-Bari is not, uh, it's not divinely inspired. You know, there would have been his position. There would have been interesting if it was a hadith. It would have been in the hadith, the text itself. Then we had another discussion and, and, and uh, that's not actually the case. <laughs> the case is that she consummated the page after puberty as the hadith say, as the tradition say, and so on. But in that case, even Fath al does not have that in the text. It, 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 and he just couldn't know. He is clueless about Islamic, um, Islamic, um, the Islamic uh, tradition and, and texts and sources. So no, Fath al did not say, IP, that you can consummate marriage before, uh, before, uh, before the period. And he tries to push that position because he knows that historically, he, deep down he knows that historically it was the norm. And he knows that he's attacking a whole millennia of people by, by blaming them of pedophilia because he knows that at the end he's just submitted to the morality of the time. Well, not totally. At least he's not pushing for LGBT for now, but you never know. So, um, yeah, he engages with that text without any preparation or knowledge. IP then mentions a paper where it says that girls, the girls were maturing slower in the pre-modern era in all alike levels, for example, in time of the Prophet, because nutritions were less, so you mature slower. But that is really a speculative exercise. Yes, you can make that claim, you can make some research about that, but you would still have to check, check, to check case by case and use forensics and archaeological data to confirm that. And then you have confirmed that Aisha did not reach the edge of puberty, even though the historical texts, which are sahih, by the way, they tell you that actually she, she, she had puberty and she had her period. May Allah be pleased with her, with, her, with Aisha. So he claims no Christian ever... Oh, yeah, of course. Because, you know, we are talking about Christians never criticizing that. And he knows that that's coming. So how does he try to defend it? He says, no Christian ever... His rationale is that no Christian ever encountered this supposed immoral practice. Uh, because So this was never... Um, this thing was never addressed by Christians who were aware that you have to be, you know, 18 years old or something. Because Muslims encountered Christians in an apology, um, Christian apologetics only recently in the West. So now Christians, oh, they see this practice, they know that Muslims believe it, and they have to show their obvious 18-year-old age standard. But it is totally false. We mentioned Prido, we mentioned all of them. You know, he's making a false argument, the fact that Christians never mentioned that. I mean, this is totally 
false. You know, it just shows how dishonest he is. He doesn't care about the pursuit of truth. He's just this defending his tribe in a racist, neocolonialist manner. We know that contacts and debates between Christians and Muslims were happening throughout the centuries. Of course, you had wars, but you had debates. You had people being invited in courts to debate their case in front of the rulers, the Sultan, the Mughal king who then accepted, uh, you know, in the Khazar Empire. These things were happening all the time. You had critics critics and tests. And you have the Britannia, and you have Rad, uh, you know, the, you have a lot of texts. Just you have so many proofs that contacts were happening, debates were happening, people were bashing each other for anything that they could find, Christians and Muslims, and even Jews in the fray. But they would never, 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 ever bring this up, you know? Um, so this is just some of the arguments that he brings about. At the end of the day, he falls actually for the anachronistic fallacy. Um, he doesn't respect really the text, he's not aware of what he's discussing, and he's not, um, I mean, he's just peddling a false narrative. That's that's what it is. I had more quotes, I would actually put them in the comments because uh, my battery died, um, so I would put some quotes in the comment. But just as a summary, you have a lot of research which say, for example, that, um, which say, for example, that, um, um, even until recently, the age of consent was quite low. You know, you have places like in, in Delaware, in America, and many others where the age of consent was 10, 12, you know, this sort of things. And um, nobody criticized that. Even now, you know, there are countries where the age of content, consent is 16, even less, perhaps, but let's stick with 16. This means that an 80-year-old man or woman could have could consummate a marriage with a 16 year old kid i mean can you imagine <laughs> in the islamic principle based on the context for example if you take the west we could actually say that's wrong because even though you have balakh and you have rushd you don't have orf it's not really customary for an 80 year old to go and marry uh, um, a 16 year old person and also you would not respect the principle of no harm and no reciprocating harm what would this marriage entail? Some form of harm, societal. Maybe there are all the types of issues. You know, you really have to think that through. So that's the power, actually, of the Islamic ethics. And that's a power that IP's Christi version of liberal, secular, sold-out Christianity does not have. So, yeah, I will put more of the quotes that I have in the, in, the, in the description of the video. So make sure to check that out. I'm sorry that the battery died, but I hope you benefited from the video, that you take time to go through this and to reflect and to really understand that this argument or, and this sort of moral attacks argument against the prophets fall flat on their face because the intention behind this content, this content is not to discredit Prophet Muhammad as a prophet. It's just to make Islam distasteful to today's sensibilities and standards and then try to push the narrative that this is false because of that, because it's distasteful. So they abandon ethics to go for an aesthetic argument and then they fall flat on their face because they believe in Abraham. They believe, sorry, they believe in, in prophets that had multiple wives. They believe in prophets that they consider as immoral. This is crazy, you know. They actually in the video IP mentions the fact that prophets sometimes were immoral, you know. Noah, God forbid, got drunk, and then um, Solomon, you know, we know how the Bible pushes this weird narrative about Prophet Lut doing incest with his daughters and God not protecting him from that. Noah getting drunk, may God forbid, and Moses doing absolute slaughters with the Amalekites and killing uh, everybody, that everything that breathed except the little virgin girls to be kept as sex slaves. And then you had, um, what is that, S Solomon or David or whatever doing idolatry. And then they married multiple wives. And then I think it was David sending one of the generals to die because he wanted to steal the wives from that. This is crazy. Islam has a very simple answer to that. These texts were corrupted. You know, we have no actual isnad chain of transmission which goes back to the actual time of the prophets of Moses and, and so on and so forth. We don't have that. Uh, just read the text. I think it was from, uh, I think it was Who Wrote the Bible from Elliot Friedman. Very good text. Um, there are some weak arguments there, I have to admit, but others are quite strong, especially the one that shows that, uh, make you understand that we don't have the Bible that goes back to the times of 
the prophets. You know, we don't have a preserved Bible. We have a Bible, Old Testament. I mean, Old Testament. Friedman speaks about Old Testament, which is the product, the product of the time. Um, and we for sure know that when it comes to Christianity, there's no way you can defend that. You, there's no way you can defend the historicity of the Bible for that matter. And so the Islam has a simple answer to that. Those prophets never did those stupid things. Those prophets, God protected them from that immorality. If anything, if I mean, there are people today that are not even prophets that are better than the prophets morality and these prophets had to be the example of morality according to the bible and they were exposed to angels and you know the realm of the invisible they were exposed to god and and, and this and then the throne of god and this and that and then what these people were like one of the worst most corrupt people that you ever saw they saw god they understood the reality of the invisible and yet they did that filth come on man come on be serious be serious prophets don't do that and islam says those texts were corrupted and there are actually stories in the Quran that refer to those stories, to those stupid stories, and then purifies them. Like the story of, of David allegedly, you know, sending the general to die because he wanted to steal the wife from the general. God protected him from such uh, accusations, which were mostly like, you know, we have in Islam also, imagine Christianity, imagine Judaism for millennia, we have weak hadith, you have weak narrations, and they make their way into the text. They did not do it for the Quran, the Quran is preserved. We have hadith that are weak and fabricated. We have a very strong mechanism to understand whether they're true or not. And we are strict in denying the false hadith, even though we might like their content for whatever reason. And we accept the true ones. But Christianity does not have such a mechanism. Judaism tries to have such a mechanism. They have names of rabbis, but we don't really know who they are. The Islam is still false. The Islam at the very best is still considered da'if, weak. So, yeah. Uh, and by the way, this was all to say that according to IP, morality in itself is not even a criteria to know whether a prophet is a true prophet or not, because he believes in David, he believes in Noah, even though they did what they did according to his um, distorted interpretation. So yeah, this is it. I hope you benefited from this video. I will keep it less than half an hour, so take your time, like maybe a podcast, put your headphones, listen to this. And then if you want, just subscribe or just tell me if there is any other video that you want me, we, you want me to answer, I will do that. Uh, it's important because I'm noticing that there is a need to push back the Dawah. You know, the old generation of Dawah has done the content. Uh, they answered all of these things, um, but they're not pushing down more content. They're doing other things, trying new formats, but I think we always have to have people working on this type of Dawah, producing always new content, doing dhikr basically, reminding people of what we already know, what we already said. Some of the content that I will share, for example, in the description uh, is from Adnan Rashid. He did a very beautiful video, I think it was one hour format, the bank and the whole thing. There are many others uh, and, 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 and this sort of arguments. Again, it's not really done to discredit um, the prophets, uh, the prophet from a theological perspective. It's just done to make Islam distasteful according to liberal secular standards. But then if you look at the text, you see prophecies, you see a preserved text, you see miracles of the prophets, the, the isnad of which is much, much stronger. It's like mutawatir stronger than um, any sort of Christian or Jewish tra um, transmitted miracle or sign. They know that you would have to believe in Prophet Muhammad. They know. But they deny it because they have a pre, um, they, they have a bias and a sort of tribalistic adherence to their own ideology. As for us, may Allah guide us to what is truth. We call upon God with the dua, with the supplication that the Prophet Muhammad taught us. Oh Allah, oh God, oh maker of everything, show us the truth as such and bless us by following it. And show us falsehood as such and bless us by staying away from it. With this, I salute you with the greetings of Islam. May the peace be upon you all and um, have a good day. Salam.